Okay, let's start in July 1958 in China. Mao Zedong announces China will have a nuclear submarine after learning of the success the United States is having with the USS Nautilus submarine. Uh, the Central Military Commission in China approved of Project 091. Uh, that is the project to build a nuclear naval vessel. Peng Shilu is named chief designer. And the submarine name will be the Long March. Long March 1. And uh, they will name each sequential submarine in this class the next number. Long March 2, Long March 3, and so on. It will be built in Bohai Shipyard in the Hulu Dao province in China. So Mao Zedong, or Cha Chairman Mao, as he's commonly referred to, uh, was born to successful peasants in the Hunan province. The Hunan province is in central China. It's an agricultural province. Uh, so he wasn't part of the dynasty, family, or royalty, if you want to call it that. He was part of the peasant class, but he was a successful um, family of successful peasants. So he wasn't the bottom of the rung, but he certainly wasn't anywhere near the top. And keep in mind, in this time in China, they are not communist. Okay, They're still under the dynasty uh, system. Uh, they've adopted communism here. He adopted communism as an ideology at Peking University in 1919. Okay. And that's a very taboo thing to have in China at this time. He became the founder of the Communist Party in New China, what they called China after 1949, um, with the Great Leap Forward. Uh, founded Chinese Institute for Atomic Energy in 1950. This is after the revolution. There's a lot that went on in China after World War II, if I can back up for a second. Uh, after World War II, uh, China was in disarray because they had had, you know, a devastating war with Japan uh, and had American help in World War II. But the ruling military class after World War II that was supported by the United States was extremely corrupt. And a lot of the military, including senior officers all the way down to the lowly foot soldier, felt that they were not getting enough of the the rewards of winning a world war with America's help. And they defected towards the communist side or, you know, under Mao's rule and left their current uh, leader and eventually pushed him out into what is now the Island of Taiwan, which is where they are today. And the communist Chinese took over in 1949. Okay. So that's the history after world war two in a brief summary, uh, 1950, they find found, the Chinese Institute for Atomic Energy, and Russia begins assisting their new communist brothers to the south in nuclear power research. In 1956, um, Stalin's dead at this point, Khrushchev is in charge, and Khrushchev and China and Mao do not get along very well. And they begin what's known as the Sino-Soviet split over the next 10 years, 1956, 1966, roughly, uh, where the two countries just kind of go apart from each other. Uh, the Great Leap Forward uh, was from 1958 to 1962. This is an agricultural collectivization uh, because there was mass starvation and famine in China. They tried to solve this by not allowing any farmer to farm for themselves. They could only farm for the collective, for the entire country, and then they would be parsed out their own you know, portion of the, of the, of the produce. Well, this did not work, and it led to huge famines. Lots of people died. Millions of people died. Um, and it led to an economic collapse of China. So the great proletarian cultural revolution happened in the 60s and uh, going into the 70s. To some extent, some people say that this never really stopped. And what the cultural revolution was, was they were trying to um, erase, essentially, iconic Chinese heritage that was not communist. So anything before 1949 and China has been around for thousands of years. There's a lot of heritage there. So they tried to get rid of all the, uh, the history, the historical sites, the icons, the statues and erect new statues in their place, celebrating communism and collectivism and the worker and so forth. Uh, this also led into a great purging of the military and any intellectual person that was in government service, which was pretty much all the intellectuals that graduated university were a part of some government program because it's a communist country now. 
And so they really hurt themselves in these purges where they arrested and executed extremely intelligent and capable people, both in the military and in the sciences during the Cultural Revolution. Now, the Cultural Revolution was supposed to end in the 70s. Uh, Mao Zedong died in 1976. So a lot of people say it didn't end until he died. But there's a good argument to be made that this Cultural Revolution never ended because they still arrest people to this day for thought crimes. And uh, Mao Zedong did die of lung and heart disease complicated by a year-long addiction to smoking. All right, so let's talk about Ping Shi Lu. He is the father of Chinese nuclear power, both civilian and naval. He's the guy responsible for getting it started. He was born in 1925 in the Gaodong province to a top Chinese communist family. Now, this was not a benefit back then because in 1925, communism was looked down upon. They were not the ruling part, political party. They were basically rebels. His parents were killed by Chinese nationalists, the ruling party, when he was eight and he was arrested. Eventually, his grandmother helped him escape. So he got out of that arrest and then he was raised by his grandmother after that. After World War II and the Civil War in China, communism is now back in fashion. He is, you know, the son of a communist leader who was murdered. So he was given some privilege and allowed to attend Moscow Power Engineering University as part of a cultural exchange program between the new communist power of Russia and China. They're trying to build their relationships in 1949, and he is a part of that. He graduates um, and comes back to China you know, with a lot of knowledge and going to help get this program off the ground. In 1958, he is designated the chief designer of Project 091, Long March 1. And in April 1970, you know, 12 years later, he built a land-based prototype nuclear power plant in the Shizuan province. That land-based prototype nuclear power reactor will be placed in the first nuclear submarine China's ever built. And let's talk about Project 596. Project 596 was the project that China created to develop their first nuclear weapon. This is related to Project 091 because they're both nuclear projects and Russia was involved in helping them. In 1951, Russia agreed to a pro provide technical assistance for nuclear weapons in exchange for uranium ore mined in China. So China has the uranium Russia needs. Russia has the technical ability that China needs and they're both communist countries. In 1951, they're gonna work together and both become nuclear powers. In 1954 to 1958, Russia helps build facilities for processing uranium, gives them a cyclotron, uh, they build gases diffusion plants, and they promise that they will deliver a workable model of a nuclear weapon. Obviously, it won't have any fuel in it, but the model will work, and they can copy future designs off this model. Uh, primary research on Project 091 begins in 1958. This is the project to build a nuclear submarine, not a nuclear bomb. Okay, but by 1958, Russia still has not delivered bomb plans or the bomb model. So China is beginning to, you know, think that Russia is in conflict with the contract. They're not delivering on their promise. Uh, the Sino-Soviet... Um, Relationships are starting to fall apart at this point. Stalin is dead at this point. Khrushchev does not like uh, Mao very much. There's a personal problem there as well as a, a political one. And Khrushchev mistakenly tells Mao in a face-to-face -face meeting that they don't need a nuclear submarine, that they have Russia's fleet to help them as they are all communist brothers together. But Mao Zedong knows better. And he was like, he wants everything to be indigenous so that they're not dependent or subservient to Russia. Yet Khrushchev is trying to make them subservient by relying on the Russian Navy. So that's a big part of the relationship falling apart. Project 091 is suspended in 1963 because of lack of funds and Khrushchev finally pulls all Russian help out of China. He's like, you're on your own. We're done with you. Good luck. But it's too late. In October 1964, just a year later, China detonates its first nuclear weapon. 
It's a 25 kiloton weapon, relatively small, but the fact that they have the ability to do this now makes China a nuclear power. Project 091, going back to the submarine, research resumes in 1965 with a new goal. They're going to build a fast attack, SSN, and then they're going to build an SSBN based on those same plans. But Project 091 is going to focus on the SSN first. In May 1970, China's first land-based nuclear power plant becomes complete. And then in 1971, that reactor is sealed up and installed on the first nuclear submarine hull, 401, Long March 1. And that is where we begin. Project 091 Han SSN subbrief. All right, Chinese Institute of Atomic Energy, or the CIAE, uh, is looked at, what they did was they looked at the US projects and Soviet nuclear projects and wanted to use them as models. Uh, they used the Russian nuclear icebreaker Lenin uh, as the model to go with when it comes to a naval nuclear system. So it's going to be, you know, a two loop, you know, primary secondary loop coolant system with seawater uh, cooling the auxiliary systems in the engine room, you know, basic nuclear design. But back in the 1960s, there was no basic about this, but this is standard by, by today's standards. Uh, they would build a land prototype first and they would begin with only 200 staff. Technicians and engineers um, are gonna start working on this design. Enter Hong Zuha. He is the father of the Chinese nuclear submarines. Okay, so this is different than nuclear power. Nu nu nuclear power is Peng. Nuclear submarines is Hong. Okay, in 1966, Hong Zuha is assigned as lead design over Project 91. He's going to be responsible for getting the submarine operational. Uh, almost immediately from 1966, 1967, Hong is accused of being a spy and he's arrested by a mob during China's Cultural Revolution. So this is kind of the problem with communism is that it is kind of mob rule. And during the Cultural Revolution that was just getting started in 1966, and like I said, hasn't really stopped. Um, they were going around arresting people, accusing people of being traitors or having foreign influence, uh, having, you know, contacts outside China's borders with other countries, especially America or Russia. Anyway, he was accused of that. And it took Premier Zhao Enlai to intervene and save his life. He was going to be absolutely convicted and sent to a life, you know, back in the fields of central China, raising livestock and growing food to feed the populace instead of designing nuclear submarines like he has a talent for. So the premier, that's like, uh, you know, it's not quite the president, but it's like the main head leader of China for diplomatic and, you know, pr pr procedural things uh, has to intervene and save this guy's life. And in uh, 1967, the prototype is completed when uh, Hong is taken back out of jail and put back into the, uh, into the system. You can see a picture of the model there. It's made out of wood. All right, so here's a little bit better picture of the model and the model being built. It's very complex. Uh, don't think that just because it's made out of wood, it is simple. It is not. They had five model designs that they were going to uh, work with. Three of the designs were based on the Soviet Foxtrot submarine. Remember, they're looking at Soviet examples and they're looking at American examples. So the Soviet Foxtrot submarine is kind of the shell that they want to make everything fit in, but they realize they don't know how big the submarine needs to be. So they have the 1800 ton, a little bit larger 2500 ton, and then finally a 5000 ton um, sketch model, nothing built, but on paper that they may go with. The second design was based on an American toy that they had two copies of um, mailed to China. And they used this toy just kind of as an example that they built this wood model around. They had a 4,000 ton uh, design and a 5,500 ton design that they eventually went with. Uh, the water drop 5,500 ton design is the one that they built uh, out of wood. Okay, they're going to build this submarine at the Bohai Ship Building Heavy Industry Company, located in the Leolong Province, that is in northern China. Uh, it's you know about north, about parallel with North Korea, uh, near the Soviet border. Uh, they produce both civilian and military vessels. 
they, a few years ago, this is not while they're building the Han, but just for a recent history, they did construct a 4,000 square foot meter assembly building, you can see there in the lower right, where they can build up to four submarines simultaneously. This is a fully enclosed climate controlled building where they can build four submarines year round because it's at such a northern latitude, the winters there are brutal, but that will not affect their ship building anymore. And that's where they're gonna build these Hans. They're gonna build five total, all right here at the Bohai Shipbuilding Heavy Industries. All right, let's begin with Han SSN 401, Hall 1. Is laid down in 1968, launched in 1970. A nuclear reactor is critical in 1971, and sea trials begin in August 1971. Sea trials are conducted for three years because they find a lot of problems, and that's not surprising. As they design their first submarine, they know there's going to be problems. They just don't know how bad the problems are going to be. And whenever they get to sea, uh, they can only do tests for three or four days at a time, submerging for only two or three days at a time uh, because of the air quality. Uh, they can't keep up with the uh, air recirculation and regeneration. Uh, they have to surface to you know, snorkel and re replace the air inside the boat. Uh, that's really bad for a nuclear submarine because nuclear submarines are supposed to stay submerged for long periods of time, and they simply can't do it with their air regen system they currently have. Also, they way underestimated the amount of shielding they needed for the reactor, and this thing is like a freaking microwave whenever you turn it on, radiating the whole crew. So they can't keep the crew at sea for long periods of time, anything more than three or four days in the beginning of this project because of the radiation problem. It's very dangerous. This is a very deadly submarine to be a crew member of uh, whenever you're underway. So Long March Sea Trials, like I said, they lasted three years. Uh, they drove over 6,000 miles in those three years. Uh, they found low efficiency thermal dynamics for the reactor. So the reactor is you know, highly dangerous and radioactive. They have to crank the reactor to a very high power level just to get enough steam to make propulsion. It's very inefficient. It's also a very noisy submarine at all speeds, slow speed, high speed, very noisy. It cannot shoot guided torpedoes at this time. It can only shoot the YU-1 straight running, World War II style, right under the surface of the water, unguided torpedo. So it's gotta be very close to a cooperative target that it can shoot at very short range. It has a very rudimentary type 603 bow mounted sonar system based on Russia's trout cheek. And that is essentially a hand dialed uh, directional sonar system where the radar or the sonar operator can listen to one direction at a time, uh, passively listening for contacts and has an active sonar mode as well. It's very old school. Um, it's very bare bones. I want you to look at the bottom photo there. See the sail number is painted 1701. Initially, this project was 1701 for a very short time, but before it was even commissioned, it was uh, changed to 401. All right, so essentially the Han 401 is watertight and functional, and that's good enough for China. Uh, the submarine, it's basically a submarine shaped test platform. They're gonna use 401 and 402, the next hull, to work out the bugs for future builds. Okay, so the Han by the numbers. The displacement is 5,500 tons, like we had talked about. The length is 98 meters. This will be extended a few meters in later builds. Uh, the beam is 10 meters wide. And I want you to look at that ratio of 98 to, to 10, or 9.8 to 1. That is a very wide submarine by today's standards. So she's kind of squat in the water. Uh, her test depth is estimated generously to be 300 meters. Uh, I've seen multiple sources say it's 150 to 200 meters. Um, it is a double hull submarine and she is highly buoyant because not only does she have the forward and aft ballast tanks for buoyancy like every other submarine does, a lot of her auxiliary tanks that hold things like high pressure air, um, diesel fuel, some gas generation uh, tanks are all in the area of the hull between the two hulls, between the pressure hull and the outer hull. And each one of those tanks displaces water, creating high buoyancy. So she is a very buoyant submarine. She has six 53 centimeter torpedo tubes. She can carry up to 20 torpedoes or 36 mines. She has one pressurized water reactor that can generate 90 megawatts. She has one shaft five bladed screw. A note about the screw blade. 
after the 1990s, there are photos of a seven-bladed screw on at least one of the Hans. So it is believed that Hulls 3, 4, or 5 got a seven-bladed screw after 1990. But for right now, it's one shaft, five-bladed screw. She can do 25 knots going downhill. Uh, she can have up to 75 crew members. And uh, teardrop style hull is based on the 1965 U.S. Toy Company uh, that we showed you a picture of earlier. And the source for that information is the chief designer himself. So that's not a rumor. That's from the chief designer that they did use the American model along with pictures of the Soviet Foxtrot submarine. All right, so uh, compartments of the Han SSN going from forward to aft, there are seven of them. You have the torpedo room up forward, and right behind that is the command module. This is pretty standard for just about every submarine, no matter what Navy you're in. Behind the command module is the front auxiliary compartment and the battery. So that would be where you have some electrical cabinets, maybe some berthing behind that. And then you have the nuclear reactor, kind of right in the center, apart, compartment four. Behind the nuclear reactor, you have the control room for the nuclear reactor and the diesel engine. Behind those is the actual engine room itself with the reduction gears and the shaft that's going out uh, the rear end. And then in a very small compartment behind that, you have a stern electronic room and hydraulics. And that would control the hydraulics for the control surfaces uh, back on the rudder and the stern planes and other systems around the boat. Seven compartments in the Han. All right, so the Han 402, this is the second hull. Keel was laid in 1975, commissioned five years later. Look at these build times, you know, five years for a, a build. Uh, in 1980, she is able to shoot the YU-3, uh, also known as the FISH-3, active homing torpedo. That is uh, ASW, ASUW, active homing torpedo. Uh, has the same limitations as the 401 because they haven't made any changes to the design at this point, even though there are planning changes in future builds. And there you can see a really good picture of the screw out of the water there. That's the five-bladed screw. All right, so they go back to the drawing board after the first two, and they're going to implement a number of improvements. One of the first things they're going to do is they got to get the noise level down. The, no the noise levels are peaking at 170 decibels, which is extremely loud for any machine. That's, you know, borderline airplane noise. Uh, so they want to, you know, get it down as far as they can. They're going to put rubber anechoic tiles around the hall like the Americans and the Soviets do. They get that idea from us. Uh, they talk with the French and the French agree to provide technical support and the Deuce 5 sonar receiver that they then named the HSQ2262 Bravo sonar system. This is a multi-generational leap from Trout Cheek. What this new sonar system gives them is sound filters, so they can filter what sounds they're listening to. That's very good for the sonar operators. Adaptive noise cancellation means as the uh, background noise changes, they don't need to manually change the display or the uh, sonar system's uh, biasing. So it does that automatically, giving the operator the optimal display at all times without any operator input. That's really good. Okay, that's a big thing. Okay, optimal linear prediction, that's just given bearing accuracy for contacts. Uh, low frequency tracking is a huge improvement because low frequencies travel a long way in the oceans. This significantly increases the detection range and detection capability of the Han with this. They have a torpedo alarm that automatically goes off if, if the sonar system thinks it hears a torpedo. And you have multi-target tracking. They can track up to three targets at once instead of having one operator with one set of headphones on Trout Cheek, steering one dial, listening at one direction at any given time. They can do a full 360 degree search around the entire azimuth and track multiple targets with target data going to a fire control system all at the same time. This is a huge leap in capability, and the French sold it to them. The new fire control system they have can um, use wire-guided torpedo command capability, so they get a new fire control system that is indigenously built, by the way. That's China's fire control system. They have improved radiation shielding to protect the crew because they can't change and they did not change the reactor at all. It's still inefficient. They have to crank it to a very high radioactive state to you know, make it work. And uh, But they just did increase the shielding to protect the crew a little, little bit more. So some of the new torpedoes that they have is the YU-3 active passive homing. That is a 35-knot 
surface ship only weapon. In other words, the YU-3 does not go down deep. It just stays right below the surface and uh, homes in on the target. They have the YU-4 in 1987. So this is them going through the 1980s here based on the Russian SAET-50. Again, ASUW passive homing uh, torpedo. The YU-6 1989 is a Mark 48 reversed engineered. Uh, I don't know how they got this information, uh, but they did, and they reverse engineered a Mark 48, giving themselves active passive homing capability, and look at the speed. They claim to have achieved 65 knots with their YU-6, a range of 45 kilometers, and it is an ASW weapon. It can go down deep and kill, kill a submarine. And the new capability that hulls three, four, and five are going to have, the first two hulls do not have this, is the YJ-8 um, MM-38 Exocet copy from France, uh, they can only launch this on the surface, which is different than other submarines. So they have to physically be on the surface, and then they can eject these out the bow tubes and uh, shoot the YJ-8. It's a subsonic anti-ship missile with a 42-kilometer range. All right, so some of the modernizations they did, uh, they got the Do 5 passive sonar system. That's a picture of the sonar system on the hull itself there on the right. Uh, France sold technical assistance along with the equipment as a package deal to China. Uh, underwater voice communication sonar has a range of about 10 miles. They uh, sold them that. The I-band search radar is Snoop Tray. Uh, that's a Russian radar system that they're using. Uh, they have ESM mast warning system on hulls three, four, and five. Again, this is all three, four, and five now. Uh, they have an improved snorkel system, inertial navigation, UHF and VLF radios. VLF is very important for long range communication. And finally, uh, an improved air conditioning system to help the crew stay submerged a little bit longer before the air goes foul. All right, so here's three, four, and five, Long March 3, Long March 4, Long March 5 with their launch and commissioning dates. Um, as you can see, they still take a couple years to build, but the time from launch to commission is only one year, meaning that the sea trials and testing um, are as expected. You know, they still know that their reactor is not great, but they've got the system down to good enough. So it's good enough to pass sea trials. It's good enough to be functional. After one year of testing between launching and commissioning uh, is all the time that they need. All three of these at the time of this recording are still in service uh, and they are scheduled to be decommed in the 2020s. Each one is a little bit longer too. That's to accommodate some of the new equipment that they have installed, like um, the new fire control system, just as an example. Also, they've added shielding to the reactor that probably added a little bit of length to the uh, submarine as well. All right, so where are they based at? Well, they're based out of uh, Zhang Gezhong submarine base there in the Yellow Sea. Um, a couple were rebased down south of Taiwan a couple years ago, but in the beginning, all five were uh, based out of this submarine base. This submarine base has subterranean uh, submarine pens, so they pull into a mountain on this on this island here, and you can see a picture of it in that submarine pen now, and that's protected from satellite photographs and, of course, bombing and whatnot. Um, we can only estimate how large this base is because it's, it is subterranean. We can't really see, but we've given it our best guess there in the lower left-hand side. You can see where they have some railways coming in and there's some access points. And if you kind of connect those um, points together in a box, it gives you an idea of how big it may be. All right, so life on board a Han. What's it like to be on one of these submarines? You know, most of the crew members are coming out of you know, central China, they may have never even seen the Pacific before, and uh, they can serve time in the army, or they can serve time in the Navy. And uh, one of the benefits the Navy has to recruit people to come on board the submarine is they serve them four meals a day versus three. And while this may not seem like a big deal to many people, to uh, people that have suffered famine and the natural disasters that China has suffered through the decades recently, uh, you know, having four meals versus three meals is, is a big thing because they've probably had family members die to famine uh, at some point along the way. And having that extra meal is a big incentive. Uh, but the meals on board the submarines were just dehydrated vegetables that were rehydrated with steam and canned meats, as you see here in the picture. 
but they seem to be enjoying themselves good enough. The work schedule is broken to 24 hour days and each shift has four hours of work followed by four hours of free time. Now I got to talk about free time. Free time isn't just do whatever you want. Free time is you got to get your five minutes of UV light radiation in the boardroom. You got to get your submarine qualifications done. You got to get maintenance done. Uh, you do need to work out or, you know, burn off excess steam because uh, the human body needs exercise as well as the mind. And uh, they also have some books and entertainment for the free time there. But the reason why there's four hours of free time is there are not enough racks for everybody in the crew. So they're basically waiting four hours for the next shift to get out of the racks so that they can get in and sleep. And when that happens in the next four hours, they get four hours of sleep. So they'll work two of these 12 hour shifts cycles in a 24 hour day. So uh, like I said, they do have paperback books. Uh, they do have dumbbells and horizontal bars for working out. And they have a 8.75 millimeter film projector, which is like a very old school, um, not, it's not even 16 millimeter. It's very old school films. So, and they would be short film reels, you know, imagine, you know, 15, 20 minute uh, bits, basically. Uh, they do have one underwater toilet or <laughs> the way this works is they have one toilet in the boat that they can use when submerged. Uh, but when they're on the surface, they have to use the toilet that is up in the sail. And remember, this boat spends a lot of time on the surface compared to other nuclear submarines because of the um, air quality inside the sub is not that great. So uh, if they're on the surface, they just have to request permission, go up to the sail and use the toilet up there. Um, but if they are submerged, they need to uh, use the toilet and then they flush it into a small holding tank. And then they have to close that valve. It's very important. Open an outer valve going out to the ocean and then with high pressure air, relatively high pressure, not really that high, blow it overboard. And they have to do that after every cycle. The holding tank isn't large enough for multiple, you know, uses. So there's uh, stories in my research I came across of people messing up that procedure and blowing the human waste up into the bathroom instead of down outside the boat, causing a complete mess. And uh, this has happened on American boats too. It is disgusting. And you have to clean it up because it's... Uh, it can spread disease if you don't. So obviously everybody hates the person who screwed up that procedure and uh, everyone's involved in the cleanup. And uh, like I said, they can be underway for two to three days at a time before surfacing as a very big limitation is why I keep bringing that up. All right. So the Han SSN operations, uh, October, 1994. So we're getting into the nineties. Now all five of them have been built by 1994. The first two are essentially mothballed. They're not officially mothballed, but they just don't go to sea anymore. Okay. Cause they did not get the upgrades. Hall three, four, and five got the upgrades. Hall three, four, and five are doing these operations in 1994. So about hundred kilometers West of Kyushu Island, uh, the USS Kitty Hawk battle group is shadowed by a Han. And I've marked it there on the map for you in these China sea. Uh, they send S3 Vikings out to localize the Han and China responds by scrambling J6 fighters to escort the Vikings. And that almost escalated out of control. America did not uh, send more fighters after the J6s. They kind of just stepped back and, you know, got away from the Han and, you know, trying to claim that as a victory as C, uh, you know, our Han can make the uh, Kitty Hawk battle group reposition 200 miles to the east because that's what they did. They went 200 miles to their side of Japan and uh, it was a victory for China. But in reality, America could have destroyed that submarine if they wanted to and they just didn't. Uh, in November 2004, so what, 10 years later, a hunt spent two hours submerged in Japanese water south of Okinawa Island. Uh, P3s were scrambled to go and watch her and they tracked her for days. The, the Han could not escape the P3s. The P3s were just on a rotation, turning over the contact uh, day after day. Finally, the, the submarine had to surface because again, the air quality is not that great. Uh, China claimed it was a navigational error. They took responsibility and said they didn't mean anything. They just traveled through Japanese water on their way to the Pacific, which in their defense, they were on the way to the Pacific, but they went through Japanese waters to get there and they got caught. 
And about 10 years later, in 2014, we have satellite images of the Han visiting Sri Lanka, which is an island south of India, in the Indian Ocean, showing that the Han does have transverse oceanic capability. Basically, they can go from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean and back again. Uh, she also did some time around the Horn of Africa because uh, the Belt Road Initiative by China has uh, investments now in that part of the world, and they are part of the anti-piracy uh, campaign around Africa. And they sent a Han over there in 2014 to participate in that. And in 2017, the very first hall uh, has been decommissioned and is now a museum in Qingdao, China, which I think is very interesting that they uh, defueled one of their submarines and made it a public museum where people can visit. So let's talk about the decommissioning of Han 401, uh, the, the uh, first hall. She uh, was completely defueled and decommissioned in October 31st, 2013, after 40 years of service. Uh, the fuel has been disposed of in long-term storage in China. Uh, basically, we have to take their word for it. So uh, we hope they were disposing of it properly. And she did become a museum in 2017. And there you can see the crew coming on board, the decontamination crew, taking their measurements and preparing to defuel uh, the ship. Okay, the Quango Naval Museum is a large naval museum with multiple ships, but they also have the Han Long March 1 on display now for everyone to go and see. And here you can see a couple pictures of the old crew members revisiting uh, the ship that they served on. Uh, you know, very proud of their achievement. And I have to say from a personal point of view, these guys are very brave because they served on board this ship. It was the first nuclear submarine. It was a test bed experiment. They knew that they were going to have problems and they, you know, after they tested it, they realized how bad the problems were, especially with the radiation level. That's a big thing. The fact that these guys have any hair at all left is uh, quite shocking to me. But uh, there they are visiting it in port and uh, giving tours and explaining, sharing some of their personal stories. And if you are ever in China, I would recommend visiting the Kwangdao Naval Museum. This is a really interesting place. Uh, I do want to point out there on the left, that picture with the circle, that is the reactor tunnel. So that is how you get from compartment three to compartment four. Uh, the reactor is there on the left and you're walking right by it. It's a very narrow passageway and uh, you know you don't want to spend any time in that tunnel. You want to quickly walk from one end to the other and shut that door because inside the tunnel uh, is, is, is high radiation. But that's how you get from forward to aft. All right, so I want to thank everybody for listening to the sub brief today and give a big shout out to all my division officers.